My name is Kenneth Foster, TDC number 999232. By 1997, at the age of 20, I was headed to death row. I have tried to use this situation as a transformation process. I wanted to show that a man here could be more than his error and that one man with courage can be a majority. When that judge hit that gavel down and said you were sentenced to death, I stopped preparing 10 years ago. I didn't wait till now. He has been in prison uh, approximately 11 years now. And I see that I'm, I'm very proud of him. I'm very proud of him. It's, it's not only just a son, but a person. Coming from the front lines, the bloody trenches, the muddy killing fields, the war for justice, the front lines, with some never go home, reach for your phone, cops are rock, ten shots to your tone. One thing I understand now, it doesn't take but a split second that you can make a mistake that can change your entire life. Ah, uh, yeah. Unit beats, motherfuckers. KLP beepers. Uh, it down, no. Like this. Who the fuck said that that's to the make? I'm the guy running grass by Brick City to face. On that night, uh, I was out with a few friends uh, myself, Mauricio Brown, and Julia Steen, and Dwayne Dillard, and, and, uh, and we had started the night going to different shows and clubs and things like this here. Earlier in that night, you know, we had committed like two stick ups. Nobody was hurt, nobody was shot or, or anything like this here. Kenneth Foster tried to drive him home and got lost in a residential area where a scantily clad woman appeared to be waving at him, so they stopped. She's very intoxicated too, and she uh, starts mouthing off to Brown and the guy in the front seat, Julia Steen. Somebody in the car had made a mention of, to Mary Patrick, you know, because she was she was a beautiful young lady, and um, she responded with, "Well, you know, if if you like what you see, take a picture to last longer." Brown then sees Michael LaHood, which is this woman's boyfriend, emerge from the shadows. Mauricio Brown, who's in the back seat, jumps out. The street's extremely dark. Mary Patrick, Mauricio Brown, and uh, Michael LaHood Jr., they were all standing under the carport talking and whatever, and everybody that was in the car, you know, we weren't paying attention to what was going on. We didn't, uh, we didn't suspect anything. We didn't think that Mauricio Brown would be doing anything. And uh, a few minutes later, we heard a shot. <laughs> My foot kind of went to the pedal. I don't know if it was purposely or if it was just reaction. Everybody in the car was just kind of shocked and everybody was like, you know, what happened? What did you do? You know, what, what went on up there? I was asleep. I awoke to noise. I asked what happened. And my son and my husband I said, Michael's been shot. So I run to the back, the carport, and I saw my son lying there. So I kissed him, and I told him that I loved him. I said, Michael, Michael. And then I realized that he was dead. There was some type of wound here. His eye was swollen as if he would have been punched, I guess from the impact of the, of the bullet and his hair was messed up in the back and there was some yellow matter, some brain matter. I saw them turn my brother's body over once they finished and taking pictures and rigor mortis had set in so his arm was stiff. And I helped load my brother's body into the bag. I helped load him into the gurney. And I knew at that moment my life 
was going to be completely different. So. If I could turn back the hands of time, I would not even have gone out that weekend. It gives me a deep pain that Michael LaHood Jr. be killed. I know he had a bright future. Kenneth was caught up in the law of parties in Texas. Just say I did something, I was riding with another person, and I get out of the car and I go do something on my own, and I come back and get in the car with them. They stop me and they charge both of us because of the law of parties. In the penal code, that allows to be, you know, a person to be charged with the same offense as the, the original actor in this case. The person is criminally responsible for the conduct of another acting with the intent to promote or assist the commission of the offense. He solicits, encourages, directs, or attempts to aid that person. He can be charged and be found guilty of that same type of offense. On trial are these men. The accused trigger man, 21-year-old Mauricio Brown, and 19-year-old Kenneth Foster, who police say drove the getaway car. This was found in the suspect's car when they were arrested. I don't think he should have been charged with anything at the LaHood residence. He's clearly a getaway driver. He gives a detailed account. He cooperates with the police. He's guilty as a party to two prior robberies, just as Steen and Dillard are. They found Kenneth guilty also of capital murder and sentenced him and Mauricio Brown to death by lethal injection. They have given him a death date of August the 30th. Hey. This song is dedicated to Kenneth Foster. 999-232. When that judge hit that gavel down and said you were sentenced to death, I stopped preparing 10 years ago. I didn't wait till now. Arrest in 96, I don't understand how they can do you like that Just for driving a car, they can put you to death You might have been bad, but never committed the crime How can they convict you for the wrong place, wrong time? I wish somebody notified the system has flunked And people are dying because they legally f***ed It makes me sick to my stomach and it tears me in pieces Knowing this is the system, people believe it This is not the answer, it can never get better People can change if we help them out together But I guess it's pretty obvious I support Tasha because she's raising on a public opinion about human rights and it's through music and through dedication it's possible to do that. Walk with me, I'll be here when you need me. Talk to me, I'll stick around, believe me. Not a valley too deep, the secrets are safe with me. Forever and a day, I guarantee. I support her in everything that she does and Kenneth's, Kenneth's case too because she's doing great things for Kenneth and he needs to see that. I think you're beautiful in a million different ways on a million different things on a million different days Tasha uh, found me on the internet and she uh, reached out to me and, and we began a, a correspondence around February 2005 and immediately we grew real close we grew real tight together she was a poet I was a poet she did music I did music it's just hard to explain how something like this comes together but you know it was just through a mere website that we met and grew and and uh, that's where it started He wrote me letters and he just tried to, in, in his own special way, tried to signal to me that he kind of had feelings for me. A 
as I sit within these walls, I don't feel separated from the one that I consider the better half of me because she and I dance in a private space called intimacy that's divided by nothing but the light that shoots from our hearts. And if you believe in past lives, it was like, okay, we must have been together in a past life because we connected so well. Then we met. I decided, you know what, I'll just come up there and visit. It was right then and there. I couldn't deny it anymore. From the day I started talking to him, I actually was in love with him. Oh, wow. I would like to say that uh, you're my heart, you're my everything. Uh, you're a godsend. You, uh, you and I both know how much you've touched me more than anybody. Um, I just want to be your best friend. I want to be your confidant. I want to be the person that you can share your dreams and nightmares with, your joys and your pain. Anything, anything that you need me to be, that's who I want to be. Um, you know that the love that we share is really beyond words. It's, it's beyond being in love. It's something very spiritual, something very divine. And you would make me a very happy man if uh, you would be my wife forever. It's about 504 cells back here on this building. I'm on a specific area that they call Death Watch where they house people with execution dates. But I look at it as every cell is Death Watch. We all have dates. We've had pretty much all of our privileges taken away from us. We don't have TVs, we don't have arts and crafts. You know, we're in a cell 22 hours a day. The conditions are filthy, the environment is, you know, it's unsanitized. The food is not prepared right. Death row in Texas is very brutal. It's total isolation. We think it's unconstitutional. However, to try to get somebody really interested in it, to challenge it either in court or to challenge it in the public arena on, on television and newspapers, it's, people don't want to do it. And it's, I think it's because they feel that people on death row are throwaway people. They're not worth anything. Their lives aren't of any value. And they're going to be executed someday, theoretically. And so why spend any energy or time on them? I've witnessed uh, 219 executions. If the question is, does prison change somebody? The answer is yes. Absolutely, prison will change somebody. The person that comes into prison on the capital murder charge is not the same person that ultimately is executed. Can you be rehabilitated? Texas law doesn't allow for that. You're simply there in that cell waiting to be executed. I think some people uh, have a certain type of essence to them. Everybody's different. Everybody's gonna react to these circumstances in different ways, but I took it very serious. I took it to heart and I knew that it was somewhat of a calling, it was, it was a sign, and I knew, that, um, I knew that I had to make a 360 degree change. And so every day I studied, every day I, I, I searched, and um, it's just been a, it's been like a catalyst, it's been like almost like a chemical reaction. And um, 
you know, it may say it, it may seem strange, but it's really been a good thing for me. It's made me a better person, and you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the person I am today. I really feel guilty because I feel like I had a big impact on his life. My father went to prison for the first time in 1979. I was three years old. And he's been to prison eight times. I don't like to point the finger at him, but I recognize that his lifestyle did affect mine. His mother and I, we were using drugs, and our life was not complete back then. I mean, it was very immature for me to do things like that in front of my son. We didn't have a very strong relationship over the 10 years, but it seems like when I got the execution date, it was just like a light went off in him. And when the date came, he just stepped up and started fighting and doing interviews and marching and being there. And it just seemed like it took that execution date for him to get right with me. Dear Dad, I just received your letter and I miss you so much. I can't wait to perform at your rally. It's going to be very fun. Well, I love you and I miss you. Love, Princess Nidesha. You don't have to tell him to write to you because he's going to answer it immediately, isn't he? Yep. He normally does. This is my baby girl and uh, this is my biggest regret that I left her. Everything I do is more so for her than myself because I'm not scared to die, but she needs somebody. And this is my regret that I wasn't able to see her go from this big to this big. She's watched me grow up from the other side of this glass. If I could wish for one thing, I would wish that my dad had, would have never went to jail and that me and him would, um, we would be able to hug and kiss each other like we did when I was little and that he would be out of jail and he would be a free man. They got to really know each other because really they did not know each other because she was born just before he was incarcerated. After a period of time, I know not now the time frame, her age and so forth, telling her that he was on death row. It may have been a couple of years ago. And she was more upset that we didn't tell her rather that what was going to happen. You know, I asked her, do you want to talk about this? How do you feel now? You know, do you have questions? And she said, you know, I'm just upset that you didn't tell me. You tried to hide it from me and just don't try to hide anything else from me and I'll be okay. And I was like, are you, are you sure? Recently, it came, was in the paper that a date had been set for his execution. Yes, we told her. She said at that moment, she decided that she was going to do everything that she possibly could to save him. I'm coming straight off death row in boots with no laces and faces scarred for pain and death as the last breath was spent spitting out handcuffed keys and the secrets of dreams to freedom. Freeing the dumb and breaking the numb from acting cold at another brother's murder as the girls from the poison with the coated saint 
I'm sorry, I love you mama, I should have tried harder Somebody's curled up on the floor with razor marks on his wrist and a long list of regrets one thing about people over here, politicians over here, is they really don't care about the masses. They don't care about the everyday people. But they do care about their colleagues. They care about people that are in position of power like they're in power. We uh, definitely need to put pressure on these politicians who have allowed this uh, law of parties to exist. We need a political movement. They need to know that it's serious. We heard about Kenneth's execution date and decided that we wanted to try to get as many people as possible to get together to figure out how can we save Kenneth's life. We're not talking about number 999232 here. Mm -hmm. We are talking about Kenneth Foster. Mm -hmm. There are family members here. He is a cousin, a son, a husband mm -hmm. on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to let everybody know that it's really important to Keep thinking about the case, but don't make him a number. So please understand that we're not here to point fingers. Kenneth made a mistake by hanging with the wrong people. Ended up at the wrong place at the wrong time. We cannot take that back. We cannot give that other family their son back. But we will try to save Kenneth in the right way and not by pointing fingers. Because if they're doing the same thing, Kenneth is going to die. And we're trying to avoid that. Now, um, Kenneth's daughter wants to say a few words. This is Nadisha. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out. We really, really, really do appreciate it. This means a lot to us because Kenneth Foster should not die. He does not belong on death row. He did not hurt anybody, and he's not going to. I'm here to ask you, what is justice? It seems that justice is just us, meaning me and my dad, eye to eye, loving each other behind the glass that they thought would separate us, but it didn't. I'm looking for something better than excuses. They hate on my dad because they say he should have known better. Are they following the law to the letter or the letter to the law? So what is justice? Shame on you, Texas. Because this time you, you're really wrong. We all make mistakes, even you. Give us justice. They say death row. They say death row. They say death row. We say hell no. Junior Wells was said this young here is a little song I wrote on death row. The killing flow, you got me here. The killing flow, you got me here to die, y'all. Down on the man death row. Dear Governor Perry, I wrote this letter from the heart, just trying to show you how one can transform how change can come. I wish I could appeal not only to your conscience, but to your soul. You're a history maker, Governor Perry, and I think what happens to me will be a relevant part of history. With God's love, Kenneth Foster. I loved Kenneth right when I met him. They say you only meet the love of your life once, and I think I did. I'm just going to be very nervous. I'll be visiting with Kenneth tomorrow, and after that we're getting married. So, um, yeah, I'm just I'm ready to be in Livingston. I wish I could snap my fingers and be there.
I don't separate marriage from death row or if I was a free person. I think marriage is one thing. It's two bodies and one soul. It's an intimate communion. It's an interrelation. And so it doesn't matter if I'm on death row. It wouldn't matter if I was in China. I mean, marriage is marriage, just like love is love, just like hate is hate, anger is anger. It's always the same. Kenneth's case is now at the point where, well, we have the execution date set for August 30th. Um, we filed, his attorney filed a motion for a stay that got denied. This time around, then that means that all we have left is Supreme Court and that we're gonna probably, uh, that we're probably gonna end up relying on the governor to grant clemency to Kenneth. And chances of that happening are not very likely. Their chances are actually very small. Texas only granted clemency once. somebody in jail uh, here in Texas, it's going to have to be by proxy. By proxy means that somebody else is going to have to stand in for him um, to be signing the papers and at the ceremony. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Uh, I've called KDAL Radio and they're going to broadcast the ceremony live. That way Kenneth can hear everything that is going on and uh, it'll make him feel like he's a, he's a part of it. Hey, you guys at the Polanski unit. We're right here for you. This is Kate on Radio, 96.1 FM. And you know, we're presenting the shout out show. Hello, my darling. How are you doing today? Well, I wanted you to know that you are in my world, but also the only one. I promise to always love you and always be there for you. Hello, David. How are you? Here the sun alternates with the rain. As we had several free days, I seized the opportunity to read for the blind persons. Mm -hmm. I've begun to read the memories of the last wife of the famous... The old. Sunday shout-out show is aimed for the men in the Polunsky unit that are, cannot communicate with their relatives. It's a way that their parents, their loved ones can call in and leave a message. Call me again, and I'd like to let you know that the last examination on Wednesday... I, I don't think that the Polunsky unit really appreciates what we're doing. We've had numerous complaints at a certain time of the day on Sundays during the shout out show, all of a sudden they were being blocked. And um, we are doing whatever we can here to get, you know, things changed. And I know we will be successful, so be strong, okay? One of the things that I always told Tasha was that I didn't want to make her a widow before I made her a wife. She said, even if we're married, if we're married or not, you know, and they kill you, do you, do you think I'm going to love you any less if I'm your wife or not? And I said, well, no, you're going to love me all the same if you have my last name or not. So she said, well, you know, honor me and give me your last name. Foster, you better be paying attention. We're not ready yet, but she's here. I want to let you know I'm here right now, so you better get ready. Stand up, jump around, everybody listen. Tell Big J to listen. Tell Tony Ford to listen. Tell Tony Medina to listen. Everybody you should listen right now, because we're about to get married. So just what? a few more minutes, but everybody make sure you tune in. Amen. Uh, we're all excited to 
Sylvia's here, we've got a whole team of people here. Kenneth, repeat after me. I, Kenneth, take you, Tasha. I, Kenneth, take you, Tasha. To be my wedded wife. To be my wedded wife. In all things. In all things. A true and faithful husband. A true and faithful husband. As long as we both shall live. As long as we both shall live. And Tasha, repeat after me. I, Tasha, Tasha take you, Kenneth. I, Tasha, take you, Kenneth. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. And according to the authority invested in me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I now pronounce you husband and wife. <laughs> and I now present to you Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Kenneth Foster. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to kiss you, girl. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals denied death row prisoner Kenneth Foster's final appeal. Foster's last recourse is the Board of Pardons and Paroles and Texas Governor Rick Perry. According to Foster's criminal attorney, Keith Hampton, five of the seven board members must recommend clemency in order for Governor Perry to consider granting it. Kenneth Foster's scheduled execution date is August 30th. Kenneth will not walk to his execution. They're gonna have to drag him to it because he always said, I will not surrender to my own murder. August 22nd, 2007. In the name of human rights, myself, Kenneth e. Foster Jr. and John Joe Amador have committed to a protest of passive non-participation in our own executions. Starting on the 23rd, we will begin to refuse all food. We will not eat any more meals served to us. Our only nourishment will be liquids. Coming from the front lines. We will be placed in cells that have video cameras where we can be observed 24-7. We cannot condone this invasion. Reports have said that Governor Perry is doing the will of the people. So, we come to you, the people, and ask for you to relook at this process. Martin Luther King Jr. said that civilization and violence are antithetical concepts. Through violence, you may murder a hater, but you can't murder hate. The fight to the end is meaning um, basically showing resistance um, you know, before your execution, you know, um, I believe that we've somewhat began to humanize the death penalty. You know, um, we participate in it. We eat these lavish death feasts, you know. Um, we walk, you know, we participate. So I think that when people in society see that, for example, if they see you go to your execution and say you eat hamburgers and chicken and steak and this and this and that, and I think people in society see this and they say, Hmm, it must not be that bad, but it actually is. We're all here for the same struggle, and when I see Kenneth Foster in here for something that he did not do, it angers me. It angers me because he did not kill nobody. He was in the car. So how could you possibly want to kill somebody that didn't have any involvement with murder? If my day does come, and the Kenneth Foster, well, We'll be free. That's the best way to explain. We'll be free from this. Me, like I said, I'm at my peace. Whatever happens to me, I'm at peace. I thank God that I had the chance.
As the 30th of August approaches, I often think about this as to just what am I going to do? What if this is carried out? Am I going to go there and watch that? I don't think so. I don't know if I could physically, mentally accept it and take it. And I think it would be better if I would not be in the presence to see something like this happen to my grandson. For years I lived with hatred. And of course I wanted revenge and I, I wanted to obviously commit the executions myself. I mean, those are human natural responses, right? I can't say that I've forgiven them yet. I know I need to, as a Christian, forgive them on my own, but I, I can't say that I have. Mm, I think the punishment is just. And, and honestly, as a Christian, if Brown, who's already been executed, if he repented, then he's in heaven, and I'm okay with that as a Christian. I just wasn't okay with him being on earth. And I feel the same thing about Foster. I want to be at his execution. I just want him to look in the eyes of somebody that loves him so much. And I just want him to be able to, you know, when he passes on, to see that there's comfort and that there's not all fighting and that, that there's not just people sitting there who want him dead. I want him to be able to look at me and know, like, okay, we lived our lives together and this is what till death do us part means. The 29th was the day where the call of the Board of Pardon and Paroles should be coming in. Uh, give me a call back whenever you hear something. Thank you, Keith. The Board of Pardon and Paroles was going to let us know if they would advise Governor Perry to stop the execution of Kenneth. Well, the governor has to do likewise. See, this is just, just one step towards uh, our final goal there. turned the hotel lobby into an office. Everybody was there, uh, Kenneth's father, Kenneth's grandfather, Kenneth's supporters, his closest friends, the people that he had been writing with for years. We waited and waited and waited, but that call never came. At the end of the day, we wrapped up and we uh, went to protest at John Amador's execution. We're just here to support the, uh, the guy that's uh, to be executed today. We're here to support him and his family. My heart really goes out to them. Uh, I don't know, if he has not, I don't think he's been executed yet. Uh, they normally do them at six o'clock, it's about 5.30 now. And uh, he could get a stay and we're praying for a stay. <laughs> He is a friend of Kenneth. He's from San Antonio, just like Kenneth. They were uh, they won the hunger strike. They won. A, they were, They've been fasting for at least a week now. I believe Kenneth should not be here tomorrow. I believe that that that. that Every, I mean, these, these executions, I mean, look at it, look around you. All you see is people cry, people hurt. And if tomorrow they get their hands on Kenneth, I promise you, this ain't over. It ain't over. 
because I'll fight and I'll scream till everybody in the damn world has heard me. And I know that all the people who support Kenneth will do the same. because I have never lost a child. I have four, two girls and two boys. Kenneth is scheduled tomorrow and I, I just don't know what it feels like. I don't want to know what it feels like. And, mm -hmm. But my heart really goes out to you. And it's just, it's just tough, it's tough. Mm -hmm. No matter what, I love my son. I know you love him, I know you love no him. I told him today, I love you, no matter what, unconditionally. Unconditionally, that's you. right. And that's how a mother is supposed to be. That's how mothers are. Executing for justice is just wrong. On all levels, it's just morally wrong. For anybody to say this man will never change, that's not right. That's not right at all. Lock a man up for life. Don't let him ever come out. But taking his life from his family, you just make him more victims. Me, like I said, I'm at my peace. I'm nervous. I am. Um, I'm emotional. I mean, I. It, it's. I have to force myself to not think. I'm hopeful, but it's scary and it's painful. It's you know when when I was out there tonight at uh, at the execution from for John. I kind of I seen his family crying, and I kind of realized that could be me. And that could be our family tomorrow, and that hit me hard.
Get all your stuff, travel cord. To the love of my life. If you open this, it means that a couple of hours from now, I'll be watching them strap you down to a table. But I'll be out there. Just look at me. I'll be there and I'll be right by the window. I'm not going nowhere. I'll probably cry, but I don't cry because I'm sad. I cry because I love you. These are not tears of sadness. These are tears of love. The day of the execution, we got a call. Kenneth had been transferred to the um, Huntsville unit a day before he was supposed to be moved. They had had four executions in a row and none of them were stopped. And I realized, why would they want to save Kenneth? I feel for Kenneth Foster's family. I feel for his daughter. I will pray for them. I'll be thinking of them when he's executed, and I'll think of them after. I have nothing but good wishes and spiritual support for them in my prayers. Uh, we heard from the board. They have voted six to one in Kenneth's favor for clemency. I went in, I had visited him, and they allowed me to go back in, and uh, I gave him the news he jumped for joy. But I told him, don't jump too long because it's not over. The governor has the last say. It's going to be up to the governor to make a decision as to what, uh, you know, if he would get clemency or not.
the governor agreed to go along with the board? Hey, the governor agrees with the board. Uh, no, no. Yes, yeah, it was one of the. All right. Can I call my mom? Does anybody have a yeah. phone I can call my mom on? Yeah. 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 Yes. coming off death row. He's coming off death row. We just heard the news. We just got the call. He's coming off death row. The governor granted it. Oh my God. I don't know when I have had this deep of a feeling. I thought I was strong. Thank you, God. We made it. We made it, and it was such a struggle, and we went through so much, so many emotions, so much hurt. We made it through. I, I, I'm, I'm so out of words right now. I'm just excited. I'm just happy. It's like my, but I can, I can call Nadisha. I can call his daughter and tell her, you know, they're not gonna kill Daddy tonight. That Daddy is, Daddy is gonna go to a different prison. You can finally hug your Daddy. Cause she ain't never hugged a Daddy. Just hours before Kenneth Foster was scheduled to be put to death by lethal injection, Governor Rick Perry decided to stop it. After reviewing the case, Perry released this statement. I believe the right and just decision is to commute Foster's sentence from the death penalty to life imprisonment. There will be justice for my innocent son, the death of an innocent man, my son. Definitely, this case didn't warrant a commutation of sentence. Nothing factually, nothing evidentially, nothing warranted it, nothing legally. I know he's not sincere, so it'll, he'll, he'll, he'll pay back some, at some point. This is my story of mistake, and it's my story of triumph. Though now I'm Kenneth Foster, number 1451768, I am above all other things here in human. Let much be learned, let all this be felt, and let it be remembered that where there's will, there's way. And that through conscious organizing, unbelievable feats can be achieved. Today is a new day, and we're taking Texas by the horns, and we're not letting go.